Well, children are uh, invited to head on down to kids' worship to learn about Jesus downstairs. And I invite you to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark as we continue our study through this Gospel. Uh, we are now um, in chapter 4 where we are getting into the parables. So as you're turning there, chapter 4, and we're going to be studying verses 1 through 20 this morning. Mark 4, verses 1 through 20. Let me read this for us. Again, he, Jesus, began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. <laughs> I love that he clarifies. The crowd wasn't in the sea, by the way. They were on the land. Verse 2. And he was teaching them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then... When tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit. Thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. This is God's word. Father, as we look at these words, we ask that the Spirit would be our teacher. We ask that uh, you would help us to understand and to apply what Jesus has here for us as we pray in his name. Amen. Well, we're getting into Jesus' most famous teaching uh, in this section of the Gospel of Mark. If you ask people what their favorite teaching of Jesus is... Most likely, you'll hear them say, well, I really love the Sermon on the Mount, or they'll probably say, I really love the parables of Jesus. Uh, Jesus taught in many different ways. There was never a teacher like the Lord Jesus, and there never will be another teacher like him. Uh, he taught in many different ways. Up to this point, he has, uh, in the gospel, taught in a didactic, logical, linear way with arguments, sort of like we preach today. But at other times, he also taught using stories. And sometimes he taught using parables, like we're looking at this morning. Now, the use of parables did not originate with Jesus. The use of parables goes way, 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 way back to the Old Testament times. Uh, but though they didn't originate with him, he certainly mastered them. There was never anybody who could use parabolic teaching like Jesus. 
And this morning, we're looking at the parable of the sower. And this is an important parable because he tells us in verse 13, if you take a look at verse 13, he tells his disciples, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? He's letting us know this parable is so important. If we don't get this one, then the rest of the parables might just go right over our heads if we don't come to grasp what this particular parable is all about. And we've got a lot of parables to come in the next coming chapters in the coming weeks. So this morning, as we look at the parable of the sower, we're going to consider three things. We're, first of all, going to look at the purpose of the parables. Then we're going to look at Jesus' explanation of the parable. And then we'll wrap it up with a few points of application. But before that, I want to set the scene. I want us to imagine that we are there with the crowd that day. Uh, You hear that Jesus is in your hometown, the great teacher, the one that everyone is saying is the Son of God. And whenever he teaches, oh, he opens up the word of God like no one you have ever heard. He's a master teacher. And so you, you, you shut everything up in your house and you, you make your way, you follow the crowd to where he's going. And verse 1, if you take a look at it, you find that he's beside the sea. And the crowd is so great that in order to kind of get some protection and self-assurance from the crowd, he separates himself. He goes off into a boat to get some distance, both probably for safety reasons and also for amplification reasons so that his voice can carry to that whole crowd. And everyone's longing and anticipation. What's he going to say? I wonder what text he's going to preach on. What is the teacher going to preach? And to your shock and surprise, he says, listen, everybody. And then he tells this strange story about a guy who goes out and scatters seed in a bunch of different places and different things happen to it. And then he dismisses the crowd and he's done. What do you think the reaction was that day? You can imagine you might go back home to your spouse and they'll say, so what did he talk on today? And you'd say, well, it was actually kind of confusing. He told a story. Now, what was the story about? Well, it was about some seed going in different places and different things happened. Oh, what was the application? He didn't really say. He didn't give anything. He just told the story and he was done. The parables would have been confusing. In fact, it confused the disciples themselves. Take a look at verse 10. The disciples, when he was alone, those around him with the twelve, asked him about the parables. They come to him and they say, I'm a little confused, Jesus. What was that all about? What, what was the meaning of that story? What is the purpose of the parables? That's the first thing that we have to consider. Jesus gives the purpose of the parables in verses 10 through 12. Uh, the purposes, uh, the, the purposes, the parables use everyday matter to illustrate eternal messages. So they're about everyday things, but they get at things that matter for all eternity. And the parables are simple in their matter. They use very ordinary things. They are complex in their meaning. Uh, Some people, when you ask them, why did Jesus use parables, Uh, people sometimes only give an answer that is half right. You may hear people say, well, Jesus used the parables because uh, stories and illustrations really have a way of making it easier for people to understand the truth that is being said. Well, that is right, but it's only half right. Jesus was a master with stories and illustrations. Uh, He was a master at that. But to say that he used them to make it easy would actually be the exact opposite of what he tells us in these verses. He tells us he used the parables not to make it easy, but to intentionally make it hard for people to understand what he was saying. Why would Jesus want to make it difficult for him to be understood? Well, he tells us in verses 10 through 12 that he used the parables to distinguish between the insiders and the outsiders, those who belong to him and those who remain outside of him. Look at how he answers the disciples in verse 11. Take a look at verse 11. First, he talks about the insiders. He says, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. Of God. These insiders are insiders because they are an in, on an inside 
secret. I wonder if you have ever been on the inside of a secret where only you and a few other people knew about something, or maybe you were part of an inside joke. Uh, that reminds me of a Michael Scott quote uh, where he says, um, I love inside jokes. I'd love to be a part of one one day. Um, <laughs> wow, that, that shows you where my brain is at. Uh, Inside joke where only you and a couple people know about it. And when something happens, only, only you laugh and everyone else is like, why are they laughing? I, I don't get it. Well, that's what Jesus is saying. His, his disciples, his followers have been let in on a secret. What is the secret? He says the secret of the kingdom of God. They have been given a heart to hear and to receive the truth about who Jesus is and that God is establishing his rule and reign through Jesus. They are the insiders. But what about the outsiders? Verse 11 again, he says, for those outside, everything is in parables. For what reason? He quotes Isaiah 6, so that they may indeed see but not perceive And may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Uh, Matthew is helpful in his gospel when he talks about this account. He fleshes it out a little more to to help us understand. In Matthew 13, uh, speaking about outsiders, he says, This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Why? Why do they not see? Why do they not hear? Why do they not understand? He goes on in verse 15, and he says, Because this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed. The outsiders do not hear what Jesus is saying because they don't want to, because they will not hear. Their hearts are hardened to him. But for the insiders, Jesus says, blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. I don't know if you experienced it in school. I do. Uh, I I remember um, the hearing test that, that they gave when they gave you those headphones, you know. And they sent different tones into one ear or the other. And if, if the tone was in your right ear, you were supposed to raise your right hand. If it was in your left, you're supposed to raise your left hand. Sometimes they tricked you and they put both in at the same time. And you were always kind of like, oh, I don't know. So what are, what are these? What are these? They're testing to see whether you can respond to what you are hearing. And that's what Jesus is saying the parables are. The parables are a spiritual hearing test for our hearts He gives the gospel, and it's a test to see, will you listen? Are you responding, or is your heart hardened? That's why he ends the parable in verse 9 saying, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Are we hearing with our hearts the gospel message? Are we passing the hearing test? Well, that's the purpose of the parables. Jesus goes on to give the explanation of the parable. Uh, If the parables in general are a spiritual hearing test for our hearts, then the parable of the sower is a test of the spiritual soil of our hearts, testing the soil of our hearts. I was very happy to discover this week that Jesus just tells us exactly what the parable means verse by verse, thing by thing. I was like, okay, I'm going to be okay. All I have to do is explain what Jesus is saying here. So let's track with him. He starts with the sower. Take a look at verse 14. Verse 14, the sower does what? The sower sows the word. What is the word that the sower is sowing? The word of God, the gospel, the message of who Jesus is. And notice, in this parable, there are many different types of soils. But how many kinds of seed are there? Just one seed. And you'll notice that this sower, he, he doesn't seem to really care where that seed goes. He, he's very, uh, he's just sort of scattering it everywhere. He's, he's a kind of a crazy farmer. Uh, we'll put some on the path. Oh, there's some rocks. We'll put some there. We'll put some among the thorns. And we'll stick some in the good soil too. He doesn't really care where it goes. He just throws it everywhere. The implication being the gospel is one message that is for all people. And it needs to go everywhere. 
The message doesn't change for one kind of person or another kind of person. The gospel is relevant and needful for every single person, and it needs to go everywhere. Uh, just think about, you, you know, I, I realize when I preach every Sunday, there are various responses to, to what I'm saying. Some are, some are locked in and really paying attention to what I'm saying. Uh, others are dead to the world asleep. Um, some, I can just tell by the look in your eye, you're, you're, you're looking at me, but your ears are totally somewhere else. Others are distracted, whispering to their neighbor. All these things are happening all at the same time. And I never know when I step down from the pulpit how much good my message does. I can only preach the gospel and trust God with the results. And that is what we all have to do when we share the gospel. When we think, well, maybe this person won't respond, it seems like a hopeless thing, we share it and we trust God with the results. And why is it that sometimes when we share the gospel, the person believes immediately, accepts it? Others, they respond sort of positively for a short season and then they want uh, nothing to do with it. And then other times there is absolute opposition to when we share. Now, Jesus says in this parable that is because there are different spiritual soils of the heart that are taking place. And he has warnings for us of three different soils that are dangerous soils for our hearts to be made up of. And why these three soils are dangerous is because there are powers at work in them that keep us in our unbelief, that keep us from believing and embracing the gospel. The first dangerous soil is the soil of the path. And the power at work in the path is the power of Satan. Take a look at verse 15. In verse 15, this is what he says. These are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear... Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. Uh, these folks actually never really hear the gospel at all. It's said to them and their hearts are hardened. They're completely opposed. And for what reason? Satan is actually at work. Uh, when we share the gospel, every time that we do so, there is an unseen spiritual warfare that is taking place in the midst of the conversation that we are having with the person. Uh, Paul told us about the spiritual warfare in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. He said, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Every time that we share the gospel with someone, we need to be doing two things. We need to be praying two things. On the one hand, we are praying for the person to be receptive. But we're also praying against something. We need to pray against the spiritual forces of darkness that would keep them from being receptive. I wonder on a Sunday morning when you're driving into church with your kids, with your spouse, do you pray uh, do you tell the kids, guys, let's pray. We're going to pray for two things. Number one, we're going to pray for ourselves and for all of our family members at, at, of the Grace Church family that we would be receptive to God's word this morning. And we're also going to pray against, we're going to pray against whatever Satan might try to do this morning in keeping people and keeping ourselves from embracing the word. When you go out to have a conversation with your unbelieving friend, do you pray for them to receive and do you pray against the schemes of Satan? The first dangerous soil is the soil of the path where Satan is at work. The second is the rocks and the power at work in the rocks is suffering. Take a look at verse 16 and 17. Jesus says, these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. These people seem to actually make a start with the gospel, don't they? Uh, when they hear it, they do what, verse 16? They receive it with joy. They have an emotional response to Jesus. There seems to be something that they're actually excited about. 
but we could say of them that they are all emotion, no devotion. The falseness of their devotion is proved when something happens. What is that something? Verse 17, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word. When it becomes difficult to be a Christian. When it's not comfortable or convenient to be a follower of Jesus. All of a sudden, the joy that they had disappears, and it proves that it was all emotion, no devotion. Why do they fall away? In verse 17, Jesus says it is because they have no root in themselves. They have no root in themselves. I don't know if you've ever read uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Um, the, the story that John Bunyan writes is the main character. His name is Christian. It's an allegory of his journey from the beginning of his faith on to heaven. And the very first companion that he has in the story is a man whose name is Pliable. And Pliable, he hears about the message that Christian has embraced, the, the message of, of the heaven that he's going to and, and how great the king is of that city. And, and he's good and kind and loving and gracious and merciful. And Pliable says, that sounds great. I'm going to join you. And they, they journey on a little bit. And as they go, they fall into a mud bog. And Pliable gets angry. And he says, you didn't tell me that this is what the journey is going to be like. You didn't tell me there were going to be difficulties. You didn't tell me that there were going to be hardships. If this is the way it's going to be, I'm going to go back home. And he turns his back and he falls away. I think uh, it's an insight that we shouldn't always necessarily put the validity of our faith and our initial emotional reaction to who Jesus is but rather the root of trust. I love the old hymn that says, my love is oft times low, my joy still ebbs and flows, but peace with him remains the same. No change, Jehovah knows. You know, some Christians, you ask them, you know, do you love Jesus? And some of them are like, yeah, I love Jesus. And other Christians, when you ask them, do you love Jesus? They're like, yes, I love Jesus. And then there are some who are like, yes, I love Jesus. <laughs> All are genuine responses. The question is not, how does our personality interact with who Jesus is? It's, does our joy remain when it's hard to be happy as a Christian? When persecution and trials arise, do we weather the storm? Those who are sown among the rocks, don't weather the storm. The third path that is the dangerous soil is the soil of the thorns, the thorns. And the power at work among the thorns is sensuality, not just um, sensuality in the sexual term, but pleasure all around, living for ple pleasure, sensuality. Take a look at verses 18 and 19. 18 and 19, Jesus says, others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. These are the folks for whom they make a start with Christ, but it becomes obvious right away or over a season that the world is where their heart actually lies. The world wins out in the end. Paul talked about one of his companions in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, one of his companions named Demas. And he said, Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. And that desertion of Paul in his journeys was a picture of a larger desertion, the desertion of Christ in Demas' heart. I think uh, one of the big dangers uh, of um, the thorny path or the thorny soil is among young adults, uh, those who are raised within the church. And right now, in this season of your life, you're at home. Maybe your parents are making you go to church, as I'm so thankful that mine made me go to church. It was not an option. Mom said, you're going to church. No ifs, ands, or buts, she said. 
but you go to church and you listen and uh, maybe for a little while you think, okay, yeah, this is good, I'm tracking, but then you go off on your own. You go to college. All of a sudden you're starting to make money and you're like, I can buy things now, this is great. No parents around for you to make, uh, to make your decisions for you. You start making your own decisions. And suddenly, suddenly you, you start actually wondering, is, is my faith my own or was I just relying on my, on my parents' faith? Was this just sort of a, a family tradition thing? And Will you be among the thorns as a young adult? Are you seeking the Lord Jesus? Is your heart open? Are you listening to Jesus with the ears of your heart? Well, the three dangerous soils in them, the, the power of Satan, suffering, and sensuality, what is the common theme? In the common theme is the fact that there was no root. That is the common theme with all three soils. None of the seed took root. So what does it look like then for a true Christian in whom the word of God has taken root in their hearts? What does it look like to be in the good soil? Jesus tells us this is what makes up the good soil in verse 20. Verse 20, he says, those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it. Not just hear it, but have actually responded to it, embraced it, said, yes, I am a sinner. I need the salvation that only Christ can give. And you place your trust in him and uh, live to obey him. And what else takes place because of that acceptance of the gospel? They bear fruit. They bear fruit. And I love that Jesus, um, uh, how he ends verse 20, he says they bear fruit 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. Some Christians have more. Some Christians have less. Uh, maybe this morning you're a 30-fold fruit Christian. And you look at some other Christians that are a 100-fold, and you think, boy, wouldn't it be great to be a 100-fold bearing fruit Christian? And Jesus would say, no, 30-fold will do. Or maybe some of you are a 100-folders, and you kinda, you're tempted to look down at the 30-folders and say, well, what's their deal? Why aren't they bearing more fruit? And Jesus would say, well, get off your high horse. 30-fold will do. 30-fold will do. They hear, they accept, and they bear fruit. And the insinuation is that all of the same pressures that are in the other soils, the three dangerous soils, are faced by the good soil as well. We face, as Christians, the same pressures. We face the attacks of Satan. We face the uh, trials and persecutions that arise in life. We face the temptation of the world. What is the difference between the good soil and the other soil in those things? The true Christian withstands the attacks of Satan, endures trials and persecutions, and turns away from worldly pleasures. The attacks of Satan we withstand. The trials of life actually make us grow stronger and the world is not where we find our satisfaction. Our faith in the word, the word of God prevails each and every time we stand upon the word. In other words, true Christians are those that persevere. Those that persevere. So let's apply it. I think in application of this parable, there are two questions that I wanna to pose to you this morning. Number one, is your heart passing the hearing test of the gospel? Are you actually hearing in the depths of your heart the gospel and responding? Are you having a heart response to Jesus? Paul tells Christians in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he says, examine yourselves, give yourself a spiritual physical to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Are you passing the hearing test, or is your heart not responding? And secondly, for those of us who are responding, the question is, are you persevering? Are you persevering in your journey with Jesus? If you have begun your race, are you running today in such a way as you are prepared to finish well all the way to the end? No matter what the hills are, no matter the valleys, uh, 
Paul writes in Colossians 1.23, continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Well, I just want to end by pointing you to Pilgrim's Progress one more time. This is at the very end of the second part of his story. Uh, at this point, Christian is almost at the end of his journey. He's almost reached heaven. And as he's about to get there, he and his companions come upon this guy who looks ragged and weary. He's wearing armor that has, that's blood-soaked. He's got blood splotches all over him. And they ask him, who are you? And he says, my name is Mr. Valiant for Truth. And he tells them of all the different trials and persecutions and battles that he has fought through and withstood and, and how he has persevered to the end. And they notice that Mr. Valiant for Truth is holding this manly sword. This is one of the manliest swords you've ever seen. And they say, can we see your sword? And he hands it to him. And this is what he says. The sword is an allegory for the word of God, the Bible. He says, let a man have one of these blades with a hand to wield it and skill to use it, and he may venture upon an angel with it. Its edge will never blunt, and it will cut through flesh and bones, soul and spirit and everything. The word of God will help us prevail. And the trumpet then sounds and Mr. Valiant is called. It's his time to go into heaven. And this is what he says before he leaves for heaven. He says to his companions, I am going to my fathers. And though with great difficulty I have arrived here, I do not regret all the trouble. And then he talks to the reader. He says, my sword I give to whoever is after me in their pilgrimage and my courage and skill to those who can get it. My marks and scars I carry with me to be a witness for me that I have fought the good fight of him who will now be my rewarder. Will you take up the sword, the word of God? Will you have the courage, as Paul did, to fight the good fight, to finish the race, to endure to the end? Will your heart be made up of the good soil that hears the word, accepts the word, and bears fruit. Will we persevere? Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that the gospel is one message for all mankind. It is a message that goes to each and every one of us, and the test for each one of us is, are we listening? Lord, we pray for those that we know whose hearts are um, made up of the soil in the path, uh, the soil among the rocks, the soil among the thorns. God, we pray that we would have the perseverance and the boldness and the help to keep sharing the gospel with them, even though it seems hopeless. And we pray that your spirit would in good time, turn their hearts into good soil. Lord, we, that is the soil that we long our own hearts to be made up of. And we pray if we uh, are 30-fold uh, Christians bearing f minimal fruit, that we would not be discouraged, but keep on keeping our eyes on Jesus. And keep us who perhaps are 100-fold Christians this morning from getting a big head. Uh, keep us humble. Uh, help us to keep on in all the trials and persecutions, all the pressures that we face, just to keep on keeping on, persevering, holding fast to the word of hope that you have given us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.